ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues uh, of the board, professors, um, students. Um, as I said, I'm very grateful to Matthias Fechter for once again, once again, inviting me to speak, even though I cannot be in Nice this time. It's a special opening and these are special times. We have had many crises in the Union over the last 10 years, but this one affects our daily lives. It even affects our lives. For people who are ill and those who have lost someone because of the pandemic, times are not so much special as tragic. My speech will deal precisely with the many dimensions of the current crisis. The current crisis is exceptional for many reasons, and here are a few of them. First of all, this crisis is global. Almost no country is escaping. It originated in one place and then spread throughout the world due to global mobility and interconnectivity. The globalization of the pandemic is linked to the globalization of economies, of tourism, of migration, climate change. Interdependence has enormous advantages, but also risks and dangers. Against the globalization of diseases, there is no real countervailing power, no global governments. On the contrary, the corona policy is national and sometimes even nationalistic. Moreover, the trade war and the undermining of multilateral organizations, institutions continue, at least until the American elections. All this is the opposite of what needs to be done. Another reason why this crisis is special. The stakes of the current crisis are life or death of people. The terrible counter now stands at more than one million people dead. The Eurozone crisis was about the life or death of a currency. That's something totally different. Jobs and prosperity are linked to the currency, but not directly human lives. And that is why the fear today of many people is so great. And that fear adds to many other fears in our society and in our civilization. This negative feeling makes consumers, by the way, and investors hesitant. In the current case, the economic problem will only be overcome when the health problem is solved, when a vaccine for all is available, when confidence is restored. So there is a link between health and wealth. It's much more than just playing with words. Let me give a, a striking example. In 2020, and 2021, 20, uh, China will grow with 9% on a year over year basis. Germany will decline by 2% and the US by 8%. So China plus nine, the US uh, uh, plus nine and the US minus eight. It reflects the differences in the effectiveness of the Corona policy. China was first in, and out of the pandemic. In this way, the pandemic reinforces geoeconomic shifts in the world and thus also the geopolitical ones. I come back on this issue later on. Look also at the growth rates of the so called BRICS countries. I recall Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, or look at the growth rates of, of other emerging economies, which until recently served as examples to illustrate the benefits of globalization. We have an historic recession with a figure of minus 12.5% in India, minus 6.5% in 
in Brazil this year. So the pandemic shows how weak governance is in some of the countries emerging and other countries. This is more than just a distinction between democracies and authoritarian regimes. There are great differences within the two groups. Compare China with the lamentable situation in Russia. Politics as such has played an increasingly important role in recent years. Politics has an influence on the pandemic, but the opposite is also true. The elections in the US were and are dominated by the pandemic. They could cause a geopolitical shift. I come back on the impact the virus has on our societies. The corona crisis affects people's, as I said it, daily lives, especially the way we interact, the way we communicate with each other, the way we live and work. It puts concrete solidarity and the sense of citizenship uh, on, on the, on the, to the test. Overcoming the pandemic depends on politics, yes, but also on citizens. Their behavior decides on winning or losing. Their behavior decides on life and death. The enemy is not only the virus, but also the behavior of some of us. After the containment of the first wave of infections in the summer, political leaders opened up society too quickly and gave the impression that the pandemic was over. The virus hit back into a second wave that cannot be stopped, my view, with the current response. It showed, all this showed, the lack of leadership is a soft form of populism. It also showed the society struggling to change its normal way of life and wanting to return as soon as possible to business as usual, despite the warnings of scientists. Another characteristic, and that makes also this crisis so special, so exceptional, another characteristic is the unique, un, un, unique way in which the virus affects people. Inequalities within countries and between countries are growing rapidly. On a global scale, extreme poverty is unfortunately increasing. For almost a quarter of a century, it went in the opposite direction. Little by little, the extreme poverty in the world decreased. In 1990, nearly 2 billion people lived on less than $1.90 a day. 27 years later, that number had dropped to 600 million people. The pandemic abruptly put an end to those years of progress. The World Bank estimates that between around 100 million people could fall into extreme poverty this year, bringing the total number at 700 million people. Another example of rising inequalities, not everyone can protect or shield themselves in the same way. Not everyone can work remotely. Not everyone will soon have access to, vaccine, to a vaccine in the same way. Older people run far more health risks than young people, but the latter lose their jobs faster. The inequalities are also related to the policies pursued in each of the countries. The more lax the health policy, the greater the economic recession and unemployment. That these are characteristics of this crisis, this current crisis. I would now like to say a few words about the structural changes in our economy. First, the, the public sector already had a central role in our economies and in our societies. The share of public spending in GDP will increase dramatically above the 45% it already had on average in the EU. 
Those expenditures and the recession this year, on average in the Eurozone, minus 8%, will bring the budget deficits to around 9% of GDP. Public debt is exploding this year. In my country, with 20% of GDP, 20 GDP points, all this in one year. And I notice only a slight decrease next year, despite the recovery. In the US and the UK, the budget deficit will be the double of the deficit in the Eurozone. It will be around 18%, one eight this year. The mitigating circumstance for everyone is that the interest rates are the lowest, not for decades, but for centuries, due to the expansionist policy of the European Central Bank and other central banks in the world. So that from 2021 on, we do not end up in the vicious circle of rising interest charges on the debt and therefore rising deficit and subsequently higher debts and so on and so on. The vicious circle. It will not happen. The European Commission is also indulging in public deficits for this year and next year because it does not want to jeopardize the recovery of the economy by austerity. It's a lesson learned from the harsh experience of the Eurozone crisis. We started austerity too soon. Monetary and budgetary policies, both are expansionist, are now much more in line. However, some form of budgetary austerity policy will inevitably start from 2022. By the way, the pandemic has brought down many taboos. I give you some examples. By suspending the Stability and Growth Pact and its tough fiscal rules, I recall the 3% rule for deficits. This pact is suspended, suspended. Another taboo, by accepting huge state aid, by de facto subsidizing uh, the wages in the private sector and it is subsidized by the public sector, by the public authorities. Again, in my country, uh, in, during the lockdown of April and May, at a certain moment, 25% of the workforce uh, were actually paid by the federal budget. Another uh, taboo that has been brought down is by the massive introduction of telework, by allowing mergers between large European companies, by a new assertiveness towards China, by strengthening climate targets, by the hyper-expansionist policy of the European Central Bank for years. And last but not least, a new taboo is, has fallen by European solidarity in the form of massive non-repayable grants instead of loans. So all this is, is quite new, never seen in the last decades. The paradox is that Germany itself was one of the first to sacrifice most of those taboos. And I'm referring to the sacred national budgetary balance. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, is all this temporary or permanent? The COVID-19 crisis itself is far from over, so too soon to judge. And by the way, it's a difficult time for taboos, so we don't know what will happen in the coming months and in the coming year. Another aspect of the economic changes uh, is that the labor market is deeply affected. Unemployment is until now almost stable in many EU countries. That's the, the good news. There's no dramatic rise at all in the unemployment figures. There is no, now a concern that it will increase, not only because of the expiration of short 
time work schemes, but also because companies in key industries and services will be compelled to restructure in ways that lead to the dismissal of workers. So these in unemployment figures are quite good, but I fear it's only temporary. Many companies are likely expecting a permanent shift in consumer and business behavior, especially in those sectors involved in mobility, in events and in gatherings. I fear that the crisis in the labor market has yet to erupt. The way of working will also change, not only the numbers of those who are employed, but also the quality, the way of working. The spectacular shift towards teleworking, where, for example, in the UK, remote working went from 5% to 47% uh, in the months April and May. So this is perhaps more permanent, this teleworking, albeit not so with these figures, of course. A hybrid form of work, one which captures more gains from home working, without losing those that stem from office and city, is the most obvious outcome. It will be a mix. The digital companies themselves that made that remote working possible, the digital companies themselves are already the largest in the world and dominate the stock exchanges in such a way that the, the latter uh, are even less representative of what is happening in the real economy as a whole. The digital giants are also wreaking havoc in the small and medium uh, sized enterprise sector through the development of e-commerce, which was also boosted during the Corona crisis. Today, the shift towards a digital world intensified and accelerated by COVID-19 will displace many low productivity workers once again. Yet new jobs will emerge as new technologies create opportunities no one has yet anticipated. But what we can reasonably anticipate, however, is that the jobs of the future will require skills that many of today's displaced workers lack. The impact of the pandemic on our economic structures outside the digital is also becoming clear. The pandemic is likely to lead to an even greater, to even greater eliminations of weak links in the production chain and to greater concentration of economic power. This gigantism also threatens to make the EU even more dependent on non-European big companies and non-European countries if we do not join forces inside, if we don't join forces inside Europe. The increased protectionism also brings changes in the supply chain on top of what was already created by the COVID crisis. So rising protectionism. This does not mean that we are facing what we call a deglobalization, less globalization or the disappearance of, the, of globalization, not at all. But it is clear that the peak of globalization is over, is behind us. Governments and other aspects are trying to mitigate this economic transition for the economy and for the people through what I can call protective policies. Governments guaranteed loans from private companies. It's a form of open and hidden state aid. It, it, it affects, you should not forget this, it affects the single market. Almost half of this state aid in the EU was given by Germany. It's very surprisingly. It took measures equivalent to 40% of its GDP, its substantial GDP. The scale of this raises the question, the scale of this state aid on, on, under different forms, this raises the question of the level playing field with other European countries 
that do not have that do not have the capacity to intervene so strongly. So it is affecting fair competition in the single market. Moreover, the national and European governments have joined forces in a major European relaunch program to compensate for the drop in demand. For the EU alone, this amounts to 1.3 trillion. And the best known package, of course, was decided on the 21st of July and amounts to 750 billion euros, of which almost 400 billion in the form of grants or subsidies, which of course are not refundable. That's completely new. Everybody was expecting that we will help countries only by, by, by loans. No, no, we, the biggest part of the support package uh, is, uh, is under the form of grants. And then if we make an addition, if we make the sum of national and European efforts to relaunch our economies, so when it is this combination of all the efforts, it represents 25% of GDP, which is also an unprecedented volume. The relaunch is not only quantitative, but also in this case, qualitative. More than a third of the recovery package is earmarked for climate action. The relaunch of the economy today is therefore about something else than just spending money on traditional infrastructure, roads, uh, harbors, and so on, as, as we did in the past. Now, this is completely new. So we are investing uh, in mainly in, in, in climate change. The pandemic, as I said, is global. Companies want to spread risks across more locations and countries want to be less dependent on the others. Also a consequence of the pandemic. We also discovered during the Corona crisis that Europe is too dependent from other countries. And that's something extremely important for understanding what will happen in the coming years. The EU wants to be more sovereign, more autonomous vis-a-vis -vis China and the US in terms of medical devices, pharmaceuticals, in the digital, in energy, on migration, defense, food, rare earth, the dollar. And this is a new political objective, making Europe less dependent and more sovereign. And we are taking action on all those fronts. I repeat and I emphasize it, Europe is lagging behind in many areas. The most spectacular example is artificial intelligence and the digital world in general. Out of the 15 largest digital companies in the world, there's not a single European. All are American or Chinese. I repeat, we are too dependent. We must not lose, and give you an example, our lead in the automotive market and the major shift towards e-vehicles that is coming, albeit, not at a, albeit at a slower pace than most futurologists uh, think. But still, it's the future. I have to say, we are taking action also in this field, the European Commission, France and Germany and others. And to say something more positive, achieving our European climate targets should give us a leading role in many related sectors. And my, my third and last chapter, what has been the role of the European Union in this particular crisis? Many citizens were surprised to find that the EU was almost absent at the start of the crisis in the spring. Health is a national competence, but few people knew it. Citizens noticed that each country reacted differently 
and that borders were gradually closing de facto, as in the pre-Schengen period. It became clear for those Eurosceptics that Europe was not a super state. Many people, on the contrary, asked for more Europe because they saw that Europe was absent and they were absent, or you are absent, because Europe is not competent as far as health is concerned. But the logical and painful consequence of these national policies, health policies, applying the own country first principle, was that they also restricted freedom of movement for people, for persons, and, the, and uh, that we are also restricting the advantages of the Schengen area. When you have a national policy, health policy, you have to protect the, your, your borders so that you keep the effectiveness of your national policy. Happily, the Commission kept the borders open for goods as much as possible, and the Commission protected the Union's external borders. At the end of June, it was decided to lift all the travel restrictions within the Schengen area. So that was, that was extremely positive. When we were ready, we opened the borders. But in the last two months, the second wave of the pandemic has started to impose some of the restrictions again. However, the EU made full use of its economic powers. There we are competent. I've already mentioned the two impressive recovery aid packages. They were an example of practical solidarity. The European Recovery Fund, created the 21st of July, will be significant for the worst hit member states. And these efforts that we made to, to to protect and to relaunch our economies. These efforts have been well received, not only in Europe, but also by the global financial markets. In those markets, there is no Euro pessimism anymore, as I've experienced during the crisis of the Eurozone. On the contrary, the Euro rose in value against the dollar to 1.20. And many are convinced in the world that the US dollar has lost its prestige as a result of the catastrophic Corona policy. The Eurozone is no longer the sick man of the world. The US and to some extent also the UK are. Let me just a footnote, let me elaborate a little bit more about climate change. Climate change affects everything. It appears more and more that deforestation is driving animals, animals carriers of viruses to areas where people live. So we need to prepare for other pandemics and we should fight even harder against climate change. There is a direct link between climate change and the pandemic. The Green Deal is the main project of the current commission and of the Union. And for our future, it is even more important than the creation of the single market, the project of the great Jacques Delors. There were questions for how the EU will fulfill its proposal to reach a net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, carbon neutrality. So there were questions. In line with this goal, this goal for, uh, that we have to achieve by 2050, in line with this goal, the Commission set out a more ambitious target for 2030. Means to cut emissions by 55% by 2030, instead of an earlier goal to cut them by only, only 40%, all this compared to the levels of 1990. So this new benchmark for 2030 represents a renewed commitment to making deep, drastic changes quickly. Emissions dropped by 25% in 2020, again, compared to 1990. And the goal was minus 20. So 
we overperformed, which is rather rare. And in the same in the same period from 1990 until 2020, our economy grew by more than 60 percent. Emissions down 25 and the economy plus 60 percent. Yes, there is a disconnect. And I even read, uh, I even have written here. Yes, we can. We delivered. The European Union member states set the target of carbon neutrality by 2050 unanimously. But of course, putting or deciding on a target is one thing. Implementation uh, is another thing. And that is to a large extent in the hands of the member states. However, the targets are legally binding. Only the result counts. How that you manage, that's the responsibility mainly of the member states. But the, you have to reach the target. The targets are legally binding. To help the member states with this, there are the billions I mentioned coming from the recovery fund. And the Commission have made a solemn promise to leave no country behind in this transformation. With the what we call the Just Transition Fund, the Commission will support the regions that have a bigger and more costly change to make. So there's another consequence of this climate policy. Meeting the, the target will reduce our energy import dependency and thus enhance our energy sovereignty. It will create millions of extra jobs and it will more than half air pollution. So this is really, the Green Deal is a major initiative and it is reinforced now, it is strengthened by the recovery fund. As I already said, the COVID crisis has not united the world, unfortunately, even though the virus itself knows no borders. The virus is global. Many multilateral institutions are either in crisis, the World Trade Organization, or have become less relevant, the UN Security Council is completely blocked, or have become uh, fragile. And I'm referring to the United Nations framework for climate change. Of course, the negative attitude of the Trump administration plays a major role in this context, but it is not the only one. Other global actors are merely expressing a lip service to multilateralism. Yet the opposite is now needed. We need more global governments because the problems, especially the pandemic, is a global phenomenon. The EU is very sincere in his support for the international order and rule-based trade. Some are even saying that we are too sincere that we are even naive. The only possible point on the international scene, the positive point, is the willingness of China and the EU to become climate neutral by 2050 or 2060. Of course, this must be implemented. These are objectives. Finally, the increase in extreme poverty particularly in Africa, should also make it possible to focus again on this neighboring continent. To a certain extent, this was already the case before the Corona period. The reasons for this renewed interest in Africa are different. Different in China, they are interested in raw materials, and the, uh, in, the Euro in the European Union, we are focused on migration, we are even too much focused on migration in our relationship with Africa. The level of debt in a number of African countries is also an urgent problem. European countries have already eased the burden. So, dear students, my last uh, word is throughout this crisis, the two main values of every institution and also the two main values of the European Union, responsibility and solidarity play an important role. In the current health crisis, the EU as such has hardly any responsibility to assume because we are not competent, as I said. 
as far as solidarity is concerned, it is practicing it, although as always, it is difficult to agree with 27. Solidarity was and remains highly controversial in the area of migration. The Commission, the Commission now proposes different types of solidarity. The first reactions are not too negative on the new Commission proposal. On climate and a transition fund is foreseen for some countries. Everyone remembers the ordeal of the Eurozone crisis to achieve solidarity in exchange for strict measures to put some national economies in order. But we practice solidarity also during the Eurozone crisis. Each time, tangible solidarity has been achieved. It has been achieved in the midst of the rise of individualism, particularism and nationalism. Thanks to this solidarity, Europe remains a unique project. This is how we recognize on this solidarity, this is how we recognize our Europe in French, not Europe. Thank you so much.